12 years. That's how long it's been since the launch of Dragon's Dogma 1. For a while, people thought this IP was as good as dead. So how amazing is it that Capcom actually decided to give a sequel a chance? And how unbelievable is it that the game's almost here? Like, it, it's real. It actually, um, you know, exists. Now, I wasn't able to finish the game, but I'd say that I've played enough of it that I'm able to give you a rundown of what this game is, what it gets right, where it maybe falters, and who it's for. So, let's begin. I gotta start by talking about the thing that makes Dragon's Dogma stand apart from other open-world RPGs, the pawn system. As the prophesied hero known as the Arisen, you have this unique power to create and command a loyal servant and companion known as a pawn. And that's where the character creator comes in. And I gotta shout out this thing because it is next level, one of the best I've ever seen, and you can use it to create both your Arisen character and your pawn. You have no doubt already seen some of the insanely accurate recreations of well-known people and characters that users have made online. So yeah, that highlights how powerful and flexible this character creator is. Now, what's cool about user-created pawns specifically is that they all essentially get uploaded online, so you may encounter other players' pawns either out and about in the open world for you to recruit, or through the use of these rift stones, which allow you to access the rift, which is this plane that features a selection of pawns to choose from. Pawns will have the appearance, be at the level, be the class or vocation, have the equipment, and retain the experiences at the point that they were uploaded, and they can even bring items and rewards that players choose to gift back to their original masters. So think of games like Soulsborne titles and its messaging system, or Death Stranding and its social strand system, and how they have these online features where players can indirectly help each other, where they are not there with you in person, but you can still feel their presence out there somewhere in some other dimension. The pawn system basically evokes that. And when you realize just how helpful these pawns can be as you progress through the game, the more you'll appreciate this whole system. Beyond being able to round out your party of up to four with abilities and fighting styles unique to each class or vocation as they're known in this game, pawns also come with specializations to aid you in your adventure. So the uh, Chirigen specialization grants pawns healing capabilities. The Hawker specialization allows pawns to barter better. The Forger specialization allows pawns to mark your map with lootable crafting materials that are nearby, and that's just to name a few. But the coolest thing of all is that pawns retain their learnings from time spent with their original masters. So if a pawn you recruit has done more quests or seen more of the open world than you have, they will offer guidance in, say, finding treasures they remember seeing nearby in another player session, or they'll help you in reaching your next quest destination because they've been through that with another player, their original Arisen master from another play session. They will tell you, like, hey, I can guide you towards the thing that you're looking for, and you can hit the go command, and they'll be like, all right, follow me, and you follow them, and it's this, like, really cool feature. Pawns are also smart enough to leverage their unique vocation ability when the situation calls for it. So there was this one time I encountered this structure with a locked door whose wall was too tall for me to scale. And just when I was about to give up and move on, my warrior pawn pointed out that he can use one of his abilities to basically give me a boost. And so I followed him and that's what he did. And that allowed me to loot the treasure there and open the door from the other side. It was just this really like unexpected moment. Now, don't expect pawns to offer the same level of like narrative depth that say Baldur's Gate 3's cast of characters does. Pawns don't really feel like real people or have in-depth backstories and motivations. And that's, you know, part of the Dragon's Dogma lore. They will occasionally chime in with like humorous quips about experiences they've had with their original masters. But for the most part, their dialogue is more sort of functional more about offering players information. Mechanically speaking, though, these multi-dimensional beings offer just a really cool party system that serve also as like a compass and also uh, your fighting companions. And it's just this online feature that's really unique and a really big standout. 
The second thing that makes Dragon's Dogma 2 stand out is its open world and the dangers that loom in it. The world itself is often just really gorgeous to behold with scenic views at almost every turn. And this looks even better when playing in an ultra wide monitor, which this game supports pretty well, which by the way is the perfect segue into the sponsor of today's video, LG Ultra Gear, a fantastic ultra wide OLED gaming monitor that I've been using these past few days. This is a new and improved model of the monitor from the last time I showed it, adding a USB-C port next to its display and HDMI ports and adopting MicroLens Array Plus technology for improved brightness. We're talking about 45 inches of screen size real estate with a 3440 by 1440 resolution, a radius of 800 millimeters, and an aspect ratio of 21 by nine, an ideal aspect ratio that gives you a wide and immersive field of view while surpassing the overall surface area and vertical length of competing brands that tend to be 49 inches with a 32 by nine aspect ratio. And yeah, playing Dragon's Dogma 2 and taking in its beautiful open world on this monitor made for really great eye candy, especially with the OLED technology that made colors really pop alongside the VESA Display HDR True Black 400 certification that makes for awesome image detail and dark scenes for a fantastic visual experience. Gameplay is also enhanced thanks to the 240 hertz refresh rate and the 0.03 millisecond response time that makes everything feel smooth and responsive. Cherry on top is that the screen is also anti-glare and low reflection, so that just greatly enhances visibility around nearby light sources. For a game that's as scenic as Dragon's Dogma 2 and features combat-heavy gameplay that requires a lot of awareness of your surroundings, being able to take advantage of all of this monitor's features just genuinely made for a better way to play this title, and there are tons of games that will benefit from the screen size, image quality, and responsiveness offered by this monitor. So yeah, I mean, this is the whole package. If you've been looking for a high quality gaming monitor to enhance your visual and gameplay experience, I really think you should check out LG's Ultra Gear, and you can do so by using my link in the description box and comment section below. So yeah, Dragon's Dogma 2's ultra-wide support was very welcome given the kind of game that it is and uh, some of the visuals and vistas that it offers. But what makes this open world compelling is what you'll find in it, especially the large-scale monsters and creatures that feel like they're straight out of Monster Hunter with a sprinkle of Shadow of Colossus. Randomly stumbling upon what are essentially these open world boss battles always generates a sense of cautious anticipation, especially if there's one monster that you've never seen before, you don't know its behavior and its attack patterns. These fights always feel epic and offer just heart-pumping spectacle. Uh, the encounters all tend to feel unique from monster to monster, and yeah, they were definitely the highlight of the game for me. And the ability to cling onto monsters and scale them in particular, kind of like Shadow Colossus, adds this extra layer of strategy and cinematic epicness that serves as sort of this cherry on top. It is also through these more epic encounters with these larger creatures where Dragon's Dogma's fun combat system really gets to shine. It's kind of your standard third-person combat affair with your basic attacks, blocks, dodges, and active abilities, but it all just feels really good, impactful, and responsive. I myself focus on the thief vocation, whose fast and agile playstyle was more my speed. And while admittedly combat can feel a bit basic and shallow in the early hours, as you level up, unlock powerful new vocation skills, and attain more variety of badass skills and movesets, that feeling quickly fades away and you kind of start seeing the fun and depth of this combat system. And what makes combat both look and feel so cool is how well realized the vocation skills are, serving as visual treats while also feeling powerful, effective, and consequential how fun these vocation skills are to use kind of makes you want to play as all the vocations. Each one is fun in its own unique way. And the game encourages you to experiment with different vocations in one playthrough as you can switch between them pretty easily at pretty much any time as long as you find a guild hall or an inn where you can do that. And even if I've only played as the thief, I've seen the other vocations in action through my pawns as well as just through gameplay footage I've seen online. And it's easy to see how differently each vocation plays, how every one offer their own unique fun. And yeah, essentially there's a play style here for everyone. And it's an especially great feeling when the entire party starts to combine their specialities and synergize their skills and abilities together during combat. That's when combat really comes alive and looks and uh, plays epically. Now, outside of combat, 
I must warn you, you'll be doing a lot of walking, for better or for worse. What players need to be ready for with Dragon's Dogma 2 is that every trek really feels like a trek. The game's open world is pretty expansive and it can take a while to reach your next destination on foot. Even simple quests might have you just walking a lot and navigating the open world. And on foot is how most of your traversal is done. There are no mounts in this game for, say, like expedient navigation, at least in the hours that I've played of it. And I believe this was an intentional choice on the part of the developers. Fast travel in this game is quite limited. So you can use ox carts found in major cities and towns, and those will only transfer transport you to other major cities and towns and usually sort of the neighboring ones and these cities and towns of course are hubs where you can rest shop for items and equipment manage your supplies take on main and side quests change your vocations and customize your character all the usual stuff you might expect in typical rpg cities and towns another way to fast travel is through consumable items known as fairy stones that upon use can only teleport you to what are known as port crystals but the thing is that those port crystals are fairly limited. There are only so many of them out and about in the open world. And then the fairy stones themselves are actually quite scarce and rare to find. So you want to be judicious with their use. This game really wants you to kind of take in the world, like go and trek it. For some, this may make journeys feel like a chore, whereas for others, the effort required in reaching destinations may actually give each journey more meaning, significance, and a greater sense of satisfaction. Uh, it depends on what kind of player you are and what you jive with. For my part, I kind of found it tedious at first, but as the game progressed and as its sort of systems uh, sort of unraveled, and as I sort of began to understand the flow of this particular game, I began to enjoy this aspect more and more. But again, it's gonna vary from player to player. In between destinations during these long treks on the road, the world constantly oppresses with hostility from mobs of enemies littered at, you know, pretty much every corner. Like there are stretches where it's very peaceful, but you'll usually encounter plenty of enemies along the way going from one destination to another. And nightfall is an especially dangerous time to travel because of limited visibility, a greater number of enemies lurking about, and the addition of spectral and undead entities as hostile elements of the open world. Not to mention that since taking damage in this game gradually diminishes your maximum health, it's actually possible for mobs to over time wear you down if you're not careful. So you wanna carry heavy but useful camping kits, which can be used to set up camp at specific camping sites and resting there will restore your max health. But even camping has the chance of being interrupted by nearby predators. So just generally, you can't be too careless when journeying in the open world. And it's always best to go prepared with the appropriate resources. There was this one time where I began my journey without any sort of camping kid. And let me tell you, that was a, a harsh journey and a lesson well learned. Now, part of preparation is carry weight management, which affects things like how fast you expend and how slowly you recover stamina. I personally tend to find excessive weight management in video games to be kind of annoying and a gripe of mine with Dragon's Dogma 2 is that I did find myself spending too much time sorting through items and looking at the items menu, especially with how much there is to loot out in the open world, just so many crafting resources to collect and the like. And going off the beaten path often results in you finding treasure chests and alongside fun discoveries like those more fierce, larger monsters in the vicinity, or maybe you'll stumble upon caves and dungeons that you can sort of explore and you might find enemies there alongside lootable treasure. There is fun to be had with exploration, but I will say that in my experience, the level of satisfaction in discovery of this game never reaches the scale or level of something like, say, Elden Ring, where you so often found amazing curiosities at every turn. Open world discoveries in Dragon's Dogma 2 are often neat, but rarely awe-inspiring. The majority of those discoveries involve some decent loot, maybe, from treasure chests at the end of the forked road, but I feel like a lot of the treasure chests offer loot that can often disappoint. And traversing the open world, you may occasionally stumble upon like a side quest NPC who may request to be escorted safely to a potentially interesting destination. So there's stuff like that, but I'd say the majority of the intrigue of open world exploration in Dragon's Dogma 2 lies in beholding its beauty and stumbling upon those more fun and epic combat encounters with more legendary creatures. As for the destinations of the journeys, they're of course defined by the main and side quests that will give your role as the arisen purpose. 
And I will say this is the area where I think Dragon's Dogma 2 stumbles the most. Quests, I'd say, often feel really basic and dull, and I think a large part of that lies in the game's dated and somewhat basic presentation. Dialogue and cutscene animations and transitions are often janky and jarring and lack smooth continuity. NPC models tend to look rather ugly up close, oftentimes with lip sync that can make Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion look facial captured. I'm an apothecary in training, you see. My family runs a little shop in Vernworth. So when I heard tell of a medicine only to be found in this village, I thought I'd come and fetch some for us. NPCs often fade in and out of existence as you traverse cities and towns or as quest events are triggered or are taking place. It feels very, I don't know, old school in a way that's hard to behold because so many modern AAA open world games and RPGs have raised the bar so high in the presentation department. Even main quest scenarios such as this one involving attending a masquerade just the masquerade scenario itself just felt very empty and hollow and like it was kind of thrown together without much scrutiny or consideration. NPC dialogue tends to lack nuance. Like the dialogue serves its function, but uh, it's all very like video gamey. Like hardly anyone feels like a real person. They all feel like video game characters fulfilling their video game purpose. Just found it very difficult to become emotionally invested in the characters. NPCs also lack appropriate reactivity. So during the Masquerade quest, for example, for fun, I decided to grab a man and just kind of throw him at guests to see what would happen, and nobody seemed to bat an eye. The quests in this game generally also feature very rudimentary activities that often feel very fetch questy in nature. And, you know, maybe that'd be fine if that was made up for with compelling storylines and character interactions and cool moments, but. Narratively, I'd say while some did offer interesting premises, the execution and the resolution rarely offered emotional or intellectual hooks or payoffs that made me feel like the premises of these quests realized their full potential. They mostly just felt like checkboxes to mark off rather than events I genuinely looked forward to seeing unravel because of genuine intrigue. I do think the main campaign offers a great setup for an intriguing plot, and the world building of Dragon's Dogma is fascinating. So in Dragon's Dogma 2, you are the Arisen, destined to fight the dragon, your heart's been taken by said dragon, but currently sitting on the throne is a false Arisen who has convinced the masses of his false title for political exploitation. I think there's a lot of potential in that synopsis, but even main quests often lack the showmanship to make this setup really shine, at least so far. Again, I've not finished the game, and it's entirely possible that things on that front will improve and pick up as I delve deeper into the campaign, but main campaign quests so far in the hours that I've played, I, I wouldn't say they paint the most evocative picture. Like anything that has you venturing out and about in the open world because of the cool stuff you find there, that stuff's fun, but a lot of quests also involve you kind of going from one place to another within the town or city that you're in, and those kinds of quests, the dialogue-heavy, plot-heavy stuff, just never managed to compel me as much as I would have liked. It's also hard to tell what to do in certain quests sometimes, or the quests guide you in confusing and misleading ways, or some quests straight up feel like they're broken. For example, there's this one quest where I had to rescue the quest giver's grandson, and once I did, my quest log straight up told me to report back to the NPC, but when I tried to do so, the quest giver basically defaulted to default dialogue and stopped acknowledging the quest altogether. So I'm stuck not being able to complete this quest right now, unless I'm missing something off. Obvious. In another quest, I was supposed to chase someone who was following me, but the stalker's AI was all wonky and nothing would happen when I caught him and tried to talk to him. Turned out that I actually had to like attack him to trigger a quest progressing conversation with this NPC, which just didn't feel natural. It felt like a very specific quest progression trigger. That wouldn't be your first instinct. There's also a main quest involving having to talk to someone in a prison cell, except the quest marker took me through the wrong entrance of the prison, so guards kept attacking me while I was trying to do this quest until I figured out where the right entrance to which I'm given permission to peruse this area was. Then there's that masquerade quest, which involves me having to approach a specific character, but that character was just nowhere to be found, and uh, there weren't enough details for me to 
gauge whether this was a broken quest or whether I'm missing something obvious. I tried looking everywhere multiple times and uh, this quest just doesn't seem to be progressing. So, and so yeah, I don't know, with this quest, I'm kind of lost on it. And these are just a few of a variety of instances where quests felt more frustrating and unintuitive than they had to be. There are just times when the questing system of Dragon's Dogma 2 feels like it was cobbled together with duct tape, like I had to fight the game to navigate through it and figure out what it wanted from me, even though I knew what to do. Also kind of wonky is this game's performance, at least on PC. I play this game on an RTX 4090, and I can tell you right now that while this game has some beautiful vistas and environments here and there, its overall graphics fidelity is nothing to write home about, especially when zooming in and looking at objects, models, and textures up close. So the game stuttering and dipping into the 30s and 40s FPS in certain cities and the like was kind of surprising to me. Like, I've seen open-world games with far better graphics fidelity run far smoother and far better than this. Now, outside of cities, the game does tend to run at above 60 FPS, but generally the game's performance has had peaks and valleys that suggested less than ideal optimization and even changing settings like turning ray tracing off or turning DLSS on would not make much of a difference in the frame rate counter. So yeah, performance and sort of the uh, rudimentary and at times janky quest system of this game, these are sort of my biggest qualms that I encountered uh, during my time with Dragon Sogma 2, but despite these issues, I feel like generally the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and I'm overall drawn to this game and uh, its take on the open world RPG genre. The pawn system feels really inspired. The game's combat alongside the gameplay variety that the myriad vocations bring to the table are consistently fun. And the stuff that happens between quest destinations, especially those open world monster encounters, offer thrilling gameplay. I think that Dragon's Dogma fans will ultimately rejoice the sequel's many accomplishments and unique attributes, but there are areas where the game feels underdeveloped, maybe stuck in the past, or fall short where other games of the genre have elevated these elements to bold new heights. Dragon's Dogma 2 does not break new ground or raise the bar in some earth-shattering way, but it is a fun game that does get more fun as systems, features, and content unravel, and there are things about it that really feel unique and really make it stand out, and it's so far a game that I do want to keep returning to. I'll have to keep playing to see if by the time credits roll, I'll feel like the game ultimately goes out with a thunderous bang. But so far, despite certain flaws and jank, I'm having a good amount of fun with Dragon's Dogma 2, and I appreciate that Capcom took a chance on this IP and on a sequel title.